Sarah Khan from Pakistan, and I have a question for Dr. Samina. But it is a lot, lot of logistic arrangement, which we requ- we have to do. I, I really like the idea of, of growing that uh, community spirit uh, in our women as, as they go through higher education. As more and more women graduate from the universities, well, the number of deaths of staff has actually gone up because of stress <laughs> and frustration and lack of total lack of support of members of staff. There are three things that you have to do uh, and you can have a combination of this and you can excel in all three. Uh, You can excel in two or you can excel in one. Congratulations to us all on being together on International Women's Day. Happy Women's Day and a happy Women's Lifetime. Happy International Women's Day. Hurrah, it is here. What a wonderful way to celebrate together. Good morning, everyone. I'll uh, just begin briefly by introducing myself. Uh, My name is Laureline Hoyt, and I'm the Director of Research and Programs for the Talwar Network at Tufts University. Uh, The Talwar Network is a global coalition of engaged universities. Let me just tell you briefly a a bit about it. Um, Since this is a joint panel between the ACU and the Talwar Network, Uh, It's an honor to be here, a privilege to have these esteemed panelists. Uh, The Talwar Network was founded at a conference in Talwar, France in 2005, and since that time the network has grown to a coalition of 237 engaged universities in 62 countries around the globe with a combined enrollment of six million students. We are committed to strengthening the civic roles and social responsibilities of students and faculty and community partners in higher education. Uh, Just to give you a brief sense of the commitment that the vice chancellors and the presidents of these universities have made, I've taken an excerpt here to describe what the institutions um, do and what their orientation is. Our institutions recognize that we do not exist in isolation from society, nor from the communities in which we are located. Instead, we carry a unique obligation to listen, understand, and contribute to the social transformation and development. So if you're interested in learning a bit more about the Talwar Network and possibly joining on, I've got the uh, website address at the bottom of this slide here. It's quite easy to find, Talwar Network. And I'm available to speak after the session, and we can stay in touch and, and hopefully continue to grow this, this coalition in years to come. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce each of our, our panelists. Uh, the title of our joint session today is Universities Engaging with Gender Issues in Their Societies. The distinguished panelists have too many accomplishments to enumerate here, and you have their biographies in your packets. So I'll introduce them only briefly, and I'll introduce them in the order that they'll be presenting today. Dr. Samina Amin Kadir is Vice Chancellor of Fatima Jemwa Women University in Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Kadir has held several senior administrative positions during her professional career, including Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, Head of the Department of English Language and Literature, 
and director of the Women Research and Resource Center at FJWU. Mm -hmm. Professor Janet Beer is Vice Chancellor of Oxford Brookes University in the United Kingdom, and she's chair of the University Alliance. She is the current chair of the steering group for the National Student Survey and co-chair of the Student Charters Group. She's also the joint chair of the Equality Challenge Unit, which she will highlight in her talk today. And last but certainly not least is Dr. Sharifa Hapsa Shahubuddin. She's the vice chancellor of University Kebakasan in Malaysia. And as Vice Chancellor, she's developed a transformation plan for the university. She's also the uh, Chairman of the Vice Chancellor's Committee and President of the National Council of Women's Organizations. And she is also on our, the Talwar Network Steering Committee. Uh, each of the panelists here will have 15 or so minutes to present their ideas. And this will give us ample time for questions and answers after the session. Uh, I ask that folks refrain um, from, from substantive questions until we, we open up for the question and answer period. But of course, if you have clarifying questions along the way, feel free to, to raise your hand and, and we can settle those early on. And happy International Women's Day. Hurrah, it is here. What a wonderful way to celebrate together. Without further ado, uh, Dr. Kadir. Happy Women's Day and a happy Women's Lifetime. It's, it's, it's very nice to be here on this occasion and to begin with this very nice message to all the women who are here. I'm going to talk about societal involvement of women in higher education institutions and it's a case study of Fatma Jinnah Women University. The first part of the presentation deals with the theoretical aspects of it because in the present scenario of globalization and social change, we have to engage with the communities and the vision about uni universities only as a place where you go and get education is, is being reviewed and revised and apart from formal academic education, it is, it is becoming apparent that we have to engage with the communities to play a role in the developing the human and social side of the students to make them wholesome citizens. They are also expected to fabricate a culture of tolerance, forbearance and acceptance to prepare youth as active citizens, each one of whom knows his or her importance in the social system and is ready to play his or her own role effectively. So the emerging role of universities is of facilitators in participatory development and social change. Social change in women, self-realization is the first step that they can play best role in bringing change in and around their life by acknowledging themselves as agents of change. And then from this, they go on to the familial level because we come for a very, from a very traditional society and from ourself, we go to the familial level that women as key actor in the family can bring changes in the everyday life by producing changes in the socialization of children. That is what we are trying to look at now and change at the societal level because after the sphere of the family life also women can be agents of change and gender equality and women's empowerment means enabling women to express their potentials as producers, managers of resources and providers of services which is not only beneficial to their own households but also their communities too. So women should not be viewed as vulnerable recipients of assistance but as powerful allies in the process of allies in the process of social and economic change. And changing values is difficult and often long-term matter. However, the changing institutional setup may affect the perceived values of participation. And in the traditional patriarchal set of Pakistan, changing gender-related perspectives is not very easy. However, like other higher, institution, higher education institutions, Fatma Jinnah Women University is playing its role to bring the change. At the university, aim at preparing not only young leadership of intellectuals, but also human beings who are more aware of their own responsibilities and contribution towards society and other human beings. And we make a conscious effort to engage the students in activities for community development and higher social participation 
this is one way of mainstreaming them because life as societies cannot exist, they cannot exist in segregation. We have a gender specific university. A very brief introduction to the university that it, it, since its inception in December 1998, it has, it was, this is the first women university of um, Pakistan, which is a gender specific, specific university. It was created in December 1998. And the reason for its creation was that a number of young women were denied higher education because their families would not allow them to go and study in co-ed institutions. So this university was set up and since its inception it has made compulsory for each of its students, whether they are undergrad or postgrad, that they have to be engaged in some kind of social community work, otherwise they are not eligible for a degree. And it's the brainchild of Dr. Najma Najim, who's sitting right here. She's the founding vice chancellor of the university. She conceived the idea. And it has taken on from, from there, and it is growing. We began with 350 students. Now we have 5,000 girl students in the university. And our students, both at the master's and bachelor's levels, complete 20 hours of community work as a part of degree requirements. This is unpaid social service that students do purely to serve the community. Initially it, was not, initially, it was just in a transitory stage, but now we are trying to structure it, and we, are going, we have put it under the Women Research and Resource Center, who monitor the places where the students can go and do community work, and make their presence felt through their leadership abilities and social service activities. They go into the society, the academia, health, and media. These are the more four major sectors where they go and they get involved with communities, and what we are trying to organize it that there is a kind of a relay of them, that four students go at one time and then it is followed up by four students, so there is a continuity and sustainability for the organizations where they're going to work and for us also to see what is happening and where it is happening. I want to highlight our pro presence in the society. Our students are involved in a variety of social service activities, working with non-governmental organizations, welfare organizations, like the SOS Village, which is for the, for the orphans and students who, for young children, the ED Center, which is a welfare organization. Now we are getting requests from these organizations for, for our students to come and work there and do their community work there. And it is very interesting that the SOS Village asks that we do not want girls to come and teach or do anything like that. We want them to come on the weekends to play with the, with the children because these are the children who are left there and they, they are placed in little houses which has a mother, 12, 12 children and one mother in that house. And they need young people to come and read out storybooks, play with them, give them attention, pamper them. And so it is, it is only on the weekends and the students go there and work on the weekends. The ED Center has a huge organization which is working for the welfare of the community. They go and work there. They do voluntary designing of web visiting cards and brochures for organizations. And they spend, go and spend time with people at old homes. A glimpse of students' community service during the earthquake in 2005. They went to the camps where the people, the IDPs, the internally displaced persons were there. And they provide all kind of mental and physical health care and did a lot of fundraising and made gifts for the underprivileged children of the local communities also. They do fundraising through various cultural activities. Our presence in the academia, we know how to synthesize the social and intellectual aspects of life. There was a conference on earthquake, how the victims were coping with it, social, human, and gender issues, what was happening after the earthquake in 2005. Our students teach at schools there during their semester breaks, and this is for the teachers. In villages, we try to organize it in such a way that they go back to their villages or back to the little towns from where they have come, and it is monitored in the sense that we know where they are, what is happening, and the organization that they work with, they give them a certificate at the end of it, which they give to us so that we know it has taken place. They teach teachers how to teach phonetics and things like that. They teach how to use audiovisual aids because we are still in the, in the chalk and talk stage at the moment. So they teach them how to make, 
maximum use of resource and management of resources which they have available to them. They teach computer skills to the disabled children, with, with, with the organizations and community, communities which have centers for disabled children. They voluntary, voluntarily design websites for schools because we have a huge department of software engineering and computer sciences. And these students, we try to fit them into these situations where they go and do design websites for schools. And they also work at school libraries because schools have little libraries and they are helter-skelter. No, they, don't, they can't afford librarians and the teachers are really hard worked and uh, have no time to devo devote to organize a library or to catalog it. So our students go and they do it, this organization for the libraries. The students of Bachelors of Computer Arts and Fine Arts voluntarily teach, at art, teach artwork at schools. They also do it for fundraising. 14th August is our Independence Day, which usually comes during the summer vacations, and lots of our students are asked by schools to come and prepare, prepare their students for little tableaus and, and dramas and things like that so that they, the, the teachers can sort of have time off and they can be organized by our students. Teacher training session highlighting the importance of using charts in the process of learning. Students creating social awareness about schizophrenic patients during a poster presentation session. Involvement in concept building workshops on citizenship. And we invite one very good thing, which is a tradition of the Fatma Jinnah Women University, that whenever we organize workshops, we don't keep it confined to the university itself. We always invite people from the, from the universities in the Twin Cities at least, so that whatever expertise is there, it is shared among the, among the locals at least. So you will see a number of men sitting there who have come from other universities. We allow them to come, and the 20% of faculty is also male faculty, but a charter says that the only enrolled students can only be women. Our presence in the health sector, our students work in hospitals, we have been commissioned by the Medical Institute in Islamabad to do murals for the Maternity Child Health Care Center. We have done murals for the children's wards in a number of hospitals so that the environment is more positive and optimistic for these children who are in the hospitals. They spend time with patients, especially in children, children's wards. Recently, we have signed and kind of an MOU with the Shifa I Trust in the, in the community, where our students go regularly to help patients who need some kind of eye treatment. A lot of our population is still non-literate. Non they do not know how to fill forms, they do not know how to read directions, and if they are suffering from any kind of eye problem, they need support in, in mobilization and going from one place to another place. So we have these groups of students who go there regularly and they help the patients to fill forms, give them directions, take them where they need to go and organize things for them. They spend time with patients, especially in the children's wards. They, deno they donate blood and organize blood donations. And recently we have signed with the blue pink ribbon campaign and we are doing a lot of awareness raising about breast cancer amongst the women and the girls are trained how to go into their own communities and pass on this message to their mothers, to their families and then to their larger community. They visit earth visiting earthquake victims in a hospital in Rawalpindi, blood donation camps with the Red Crescent Society and other organizations. They organize medical activities, different kind of me medical activities. We had, during the last blood donation campaign, we discovered that a large number of our, our students are anemic. So we have had regular sort of lecture sessions about diets and how they can look after themselves, donating blood. In the media, our students are working as journalists, newscasters, presenters. They go and they, this community work in, in, the, in the media. They write reports for organizations. We have our own radio, which is called Radio Wow, which is Voice of Women. It is a platform where students present and discuss social issues. 
Through different activities, they play their role in creating social awareness. This radio is completely managed by students. We have a sound engineer and another engineer, but otherwise the organization, the presentations, script writing, broadcasting activities are all student-related activities. And the mandate is because they have to do 60% academic thing and 40%, no, 40% academic, 20% 20 to 30 percent entertainment, and the other are social service programs, which they are doing for the communities. And there is huge, usually a huge waiting list. The students are very keen to participate and perform and do all kinds of activities with the media. It is a platform for creating social awareness. These are the views of students on community work. It should not be limited to these 20 hours only, and we cannot fulfill all our social responsibility through it, but it gives a kind of realization to us for our role and responsibility in the welfare of the society. We, we are trying to organize it that we know where they are because we have a responsibility to them. And initially, when Dr. Najma started the program, there was a lot of resistance from the parents to the program. They said, we are sending them to a woman's organization. Why are you sending them to hospitals and organizations where there are men? So it took us a long time to fight that resistance from the parents and tell them that if they are giving an education to their girls, to their daughters, they can't keep them segregated all their life. The world is not populated by women in one segment and men in the other. We have to mainstream them. And sometimes when they go for their community work, they get job offers and they are they are sort of gobbled up by the industry so much so that my English department never gets TAs from our own department. They go and they, they are taken up by the industry or the organizations where they are volunteering to work because their English skills are, are good and that is what they require for report writing or for their office work and so on and so forth. The resistance has died away now. But there are little problems of organization because we are very careful to see that the girls don't go to their familial organizations, not to their uncle's institution or their uncle's organization or their aunt's school. We see that they go somewhere where they will have to do, they will have to make a commitment of working for the 20 hours and they will be doing it in a mainstream area away from their familial setup so that they learn how to integrate with the society and they learn how to contribute to the society. The smile that I brought on the faces of young children was a reward in itself and, I, and it truly strengthened my belief in the famous quote that if I have brought a smile on a face, I have not lived in vain. Another student who said, as a community work activity, I worked in a school library, helped them organize books and create catalogs of available resources. It was a wonderful feeling that I could contribute to my community, no matter on how small a scale. I can never forget the sigh of relief of the librarian and the shine in the eyes of the students. This school was fortunate enough to have a librarian. If you have 5,000 books in your library, then you are allowed to have a librarian. Otherwise, if you have 4,999 books, you can't have a librarian. So, and even if you have the vacancy for a librarian, it doesn't mean that you'll get one. Or you'll get one who's a librarian. It could be somebody's relative, it could be an ad hoc person who has, was related to somebody who needs the job and knows nothing about books, so you will see, go to schools and see books which are upside down, which are not catalogued, which are on the shelf, in the wrong shelves. So th this, is, this is a constant battle which, which we have to fight, and, the student, and this is one way of going back to the community. We have made it a policy that they are not going to do community work in the university. They have to move out. It is because it's a comfort zone, you know, that I would like to work in the library of the university. I would like to work, clean up the university. The environment science students want to do different kinds of tests and cleaning up process in the, in the, in the university. But it is mandatory that it has to be outside the university so that they go into the society, into the community, and find their own niche there and learn how to integrate with the society and the community independently on their own. 
We don't allow them to go. It's, it's harsh saying don't allow them to go. We don't encourage them to go in groups of more than three. Because then it is difficult for the organization to see, to, uh, we have found that it is difficult for the organizations to monitor larger groups. And they also prefer, in very rare circumstances, four students go together. But we encourage them to go as pairs or as three because it, in, it reduces the transportation cost for them. And it, re, it is more of a safety factor for them if they are going in groups and they are, they are there to support each other. That's it. In short, we teach our students too often we think that we need to get paid for everything we do without thinking that there are other forms of payment like the contentment in knowing that you can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and next we'll have Vice Chancellor Beer. Congratulations to us all on being together on International Women's Day with a few token males um, also <laughs> in, the, in the audience. Um, the wonderful papers we've heard this week from proper experts in the field. And I'm going to conceal my absence of knowledge in any appropriate field by wide-ranging wide kind of conversations about the things that are on my mind and with a bit of information about... Um, what I see is the civic role of universities in general and, and some stuff about mine in particular. Um, so I'm going to talk about what's going on across a range of activities, but also I just wanted to make a little bit of time for some general comments about some vague anxieties I have about the, um, the reshaping of our student finance system in the UK. Now I realise that this is quite parochial, but I also think that maybe people might be interested in this um, experiment that the UK government is embarking upon. Uh, that the rest of the world seems to be quite happy for us to embark upon um, and watching with some amusement. So, um, what we're going to cover, universities more than just a degree. Now, I had the um, distinction earlier this year of being lampooned on the back page of the Times um, Education, Higher Education, um, what used to be the Times Higher Education Supplement and is now the, no, just Times Higher something like that, can't remember. But the um, Laurie Taylor column, familiar to those of you in the UK, um, he mocked my use of the word hinterland because the vice chancellor of his fictional university, Poppleton, was sent out to look for Poppleton's hinterland. <laughs> what I was talking about were the things that only universities can offer. And I will be saying a little bit more about that. And I see the civic and community dimension of university work as something which is special to university, something which is special that we can offer our students in this increasingly competitive world in terms of their employment. Um, and it is, you know, it, it is especially important to, to remind our students when, um, when part of the um, intent of the current education reforms in the UK is to broaden the range of providers and to bring in private providers and our education minister is on record as having said that he wants to see a university in every disused office block. Well, his idea of a university is, is different to mine and what I fear he means is that that university is for other people's children, not probably for his own. So, um, the balance of benefit I think is something that's also lost in this argument because what we have been seeing is a very instrumental discourse from our government in terms of what university is for and they are trying to talk about it being as a benefit only for the individual so the societal benefit has not been spoken about sufficiently. Um, so other people this week have mentioned um, the OECD work on um, uh, higher education, education at a glance. Cheryl referenced this um, on day one. So I just want to put up a few of my, of my favorite slides and I've been using these all over the place because I am trying to demonstrate that this is something um, that is not just about the individual, it's not just about earning power, it is about the way in which higher education benefits society as a whole. You can see the OECD average down there um, in terms of the earnings benefit that is clear right across the OECD nations. But the other interesting element is the, is the public benefit. Now this is the, um, the slide that shows that for men. 
and here it is for women. Um, the earnings is lower, we all know that, we've been talking about that, um, but the average um, over the course of a lifetime is still worth having. And indeed the social benefit, that's for women, far outweigh the costs. You'll forgive me for going quite quickly through these. And for men, somebody already mentioned this week that the social benefit, unsurprisingly, is higher uh, for women. The personal benefit is not. Now, this is my very favorite slide. Now, I am particularly fond of this because, of course, it's consistent across all OECD nations that the, the red triangles signify those with graduate level education, that graduates tend to be more satisfied with life. But it demonstrates the thing that we all know, that the Russians are terribly miserable. <laughs> uh, closely followed by the Greeks and the Hungarians, bless them. But um, it's, um, it is, again, worth remembering uh, in this age of, of instrumentalism that graduates are happier people. They are more content. And they contribute more to society. They're less likely to be lawbreakers. They generally make good parents. Um, they save their countries huge amounts of money in social welfare payment, uh, taxes paid, people employed. All these benefits we don't talk enough about, I think. The, um, yeah, the, the discourse is all about you know, privilege and um, individual benefit. Um, this is an interesting slide. You read from, from right to left, and you can see that on a number of... I'm sure you can't see, actually. Let me help you with this. So that top... Um, actually, let's go from the bottom up. That, um, the yellow slide, level five education, is on the, on the left. Level one uh, is on the right. And the green, the green dotted line at the bottom is about volunteering. Now, those of you who have looked into this, volunteering does make you more content with life. People who volunteer generally live longer. I don't know how that one. You also have to be tall and eat breakfast on those. But uh, <laughs> let that be a lesson to you. Grow taller. Um, and um, the, the red solid line, that's a health indicator. And um, the blue one, poor understanding of political issues. So you can see these things all move upwards towards the right of the slide. The dotted line, poor political efficacy. Um, the orange segmented line, poor level of general trust, trust in their fellow citizens. Um, the, um, the orange, sorry, that was, that's the orange line. And the uh, solid yellow line, a lower propensity to reciprocate. I do, I do urge you to look in the, at these slides in detail on the OECD website. And the, um, the, the top blue one, um, you would believe that people are trying to take advantage of you um, more easily, uh, the less your education. And we do this um, report out of UUK, in, um, which is the Vice Chancellor's organization, about the wider impact of, of universities. And I've been thinking about this in the context of the refreshing of the language that we were discussing yesterday, um, and that Louise particularly talked about. And I think it's time also to refresh the kind of language we talk about public benefit, because we're not winning any arguments with, with the current set of indicators. Um, about you know, how well we do. Uh, the UK government, for instance, is completely unpersuaded by our arguments about the, the larger as well as the financial benefits to the HE sector of educating students from overseas. Um, so we're, we're not winning the hearts and minds of people um, with, um, with, with the current way we're describing the work that we do. Um, one of the things I'm always saying is that 80% of new jobs require graduate level skills, 80%. And, and again, you know, people in the street come and talk about the fact that there are too many universities, there are too many graduates. Well, the, the truth of the matter is there are not enough. And again, we don't say that, um, or at least not in a way that is heard. 
We had a very interesting situation at Oxford Brooks uh, recently where um, we had a, a major battle with the planning authorities uh, to build a new library. You would have thought it was a chemical plant or at the very least a gin <laughs> palace with the vociferous response of the local community against it. Um, in many university cities in the UK, there is this kind of hostility between the community um, and, the, and the university, and it is actually quite profound in Oxford. You would think that um, Oxford, the home of learning, in a sense, in the UK, would, would not be fighting these battles, but it is um, a constant chipping away. And so we did a lot of work on our economic impact in the community, and we, we work out that the university puts about a million a day into the economy, um, partly through our 18,000 students, but partly through, you know, being a, a big local employer, purchasing locally, all those things, um, our efficacy in terms of research and development. And um, we think it was uh, instrumental in finally allowing us to get the planning permission. And I also say that um, Teresa's not the only one on a bus, but I was less kind to my colleagues. They're on the back, Teresa. So. <laughs> Um, the jokes about looking like the back of a bus um, flow freely. But we, we ran a campaign called Valuable Invaluable, and what we did on those buses was to have a picture of one of our Brooks trained nurses with invaluable labelled across her, one of our primary school teachers, invaluable, just trying to get people to think about the social benefit as well as the, the economic benefit of, of universities. And as I said, that, that did have a positive impact. We also make the focus um, for voluntary giving in the university, civic and community engagement. So I'm going to talk about a few examples. You see the lovely Caroline there, she's an architecture student, and um, she led on the building of a community garden in Barracks Lane in Oxford. Um, our accounting and finance students, they receive education in charity accounting from Critchley's, which is a local accountancy firm, and then as part of the virtuous circle here, they take that training and they do the books for small NGOs in Oxford. So private enterprise adding value to the students because they then have that training, they then put it to work in the community. We're also supporting our pro bono clinic, um, the law students giving legal advice. So we're putting the, um, the alumni donations uh, to work. And I have to say that our accountancy program is dominated by women. The, um, the architecture program is more mixed, but it does tend to be the case that the women are coming forward with the community projects. Um, okay, so some general stuff about tackling inequalities. UK social scientists are doing a lot of work on inequality in terms of pay. Current progress in the UK is not good. Um, women are paid about 15% less per hour than men. And again, the research, uh, the evidence is more necessary now than ever because our Home Secretary and indeed Minister for Equalities, Theresa May, is refusing to enact Section 78 of the Equalities Act that would have given government powers to require business uh, to measure and publish pay inequalities. Human rights law, similarly, it's a particular specialization of my colleagues in the law department at Brooks, is under attack from the UK government um, who want a separate British Bill of Rights. Um, the academic research, I think, can help to highlight the weaknesses in this proposition. I can talk more about that outside. My chancellor is Shami Chakrabarti, who heads up the um, organization Liberty, and she is leading the fight against this. And I just wanted to, um, to talk about my colleague Margaret Harris, who's down the bottom on the left there. She is, has bravely gone into, into the, the man's world of um, car automotive um, development here um, because she's a psychologist. She is leading the biggest study in the world of the psychology of car ownership. Not car ownership as we understand it, but hybrid car ownership. Okay, so the previous um, chief exec of, of um, the mini plant in Oxford said to me that everybody thinks 
that electric cars are a good idea and everybody thinks their neighbour should own one. And so Margaret and her team, um, funded by the Technology Strategy Board, are doing a massive, massive study of what makes people afraid to, to invest in this technology, what makes people go for it. So. Um, the engineers are very grumpy about this massive amount of funding going into the psychologists, as you can imagine. But um, we need social science in order to explain the world. Okay, you've been hearing this week about Athena Swan, um, which is the, um, uh, the organization underpinned by the belief that the advancement of science, engineering and technology vital for the world's health and development can't reach its full potential unless both men and women contribute and benefit from its effects. And there's my colleague Munira Kadim, who's doing vital work on radiation and cell mutation. Um, the Equality Challenge Unit, again, I urge you to visit the website, won't dwell on it now. Um, uh, Lorleen mentioned it in my introduction. I just thought that I would tell you about how we arrived at the place where I co-chair it with Chris Brink, um, whose colleagues from South Africa will know. Um, we're both on the board, both there as UK nominees. The chair was retiring. I have a background in equality. Chris has a background in diversity. We had to find a new chair. I rang him up and said, Chris, what, what about doing it together? And he said, give me 24 hours and I will come back to you. So he came back to me in 24 hours and he said, I've decided that this is a woman proposition. <laughs> Only a woman would have made this proposition and therefore I'm going to go for it. So you can make what you like of that. I just thought I would mention it. Okay. In our Center for Diversity and Policy Research, um, there's particular uh, focus on women's representation in senior academic positions. We had a, a big conference at Brooks uh, last September about senior women leadership. We were encompassing all um, sectors, private, public, third and political. Um, we did have only women speakers and it was a, it was a policy and um, a few men were brave enough to come but it was absolutely remarkable the kind of level of frankness and engagement from many of the senior leaders, particularly in business, in that environment. And I'm going to talk in, in more detail briefly in a minute about one of the panels. We talked a lot about the quota issue. And um, Mari Teigen, who's done the work in Norway on quotas, and I know you, you were opened on Monday, on Tuesday, sorry, by um, the Norwegian ambassador. Um, she was talking about the fact that one of the the ways in the UK that that quota system is being talked about is by um, reference to golden skirts. Who's heard of golden skirts? Okay, this is um, what they're saying is that there, there really isn't a shift up to 40% of board membership in, in Norway because it is the same women who sit on all the boards and they're calling them golden skirts. Now, Mari's done the research which shows that only 1% of board members have more than one board membership and it's exactly the same for men and for women. So this golden skirts thing is yet another, and we've been thinking about language, we've been thinking about discourse, yet another way of pretending that something is not efficacious, so that the quota system is not efficacious, that you're just privileging a tiny minority of women. But it, is, it just is a very interesting spin that the UK kind of financial and, and business sector are putting on um, the success. You cannot you cannot say that it's anything other than a huge success in, in Norway. Um, loaded language, indeed. Okay, and um, three, how am I doing? Okay, three very brief stories. Okay, um, about 10 years ago, a student came to, to Brooks from, uh, from Kenya and did our postgraduate diploma in palliative care because there was no qualification available in, in her country. And um, she wanted to, to make it happen in, uh, in Nairobi. And so in 2001, um, flying faculty from Brooks delivered the first cohort um, in the hospice in Nairobi um, to a group of students, it's all women staff, um, to begin with all women students. Um, 
training and empowering women to, to work in their local communities. Every year a graduate would join the teaching team until now, a decade later, um, the, the program is self-sustaining. So it's a program that we're very, very proud of. The numbers aren't huge as yet. The cohorts tend to be between 25 and 30, but now it's completely locally managed. We still do the quality, but it's something that we were able to grow, not at profit, but funded again by generous donations from our, our sponsors um, and, and often um, alumni. Something that I'm particularly proud of. This is um, Jamila al -Zanin. She's our current Gaza scholarship holder. Um, she's doing the Masters in Development and Emergency Practice. Um, it's a big program at Brooks. Students from more than 40 countries annually uh, training uh, and developing people to work in disaster and emergency situations. And what I wanted to do here with them um, is just to read you an extract from Jamila's personal statement when she applied for the Gaza Scholarship. Without being a citizen in one of the most chaotic and unsafe places in the world, my life would have been much easier. Having to study in the light of candles and sleeping in the music of bombs and explosives every night, I knew I had to make a difference and not surrender against obstacles. I managed to get my bachelor degree in this hectic situation and have always been an active member in peace organizations and community development activities. I am in a constant challenge with myself to be a role model for other females in a male dominant society. It's a very humbling experience to meet these young people coming out of situations like this and wanting to engage in education and then take that education back to their communities. I just wanted to amuse you with a story about this panel. It was a kind of question time shared, chaired by Shami. And you've got in the zigzag jacket on the right, Colonel Marion Lauder, who regaled us with tales of being trained at Sandhurst. She and the one other woman in her cohort, when she was being trained as an officer, were taken out of one aspect of the training that the other male members of, of, of that cohort received in order to receive instruction in flower arranging. <laughs> Sarah Thornton's next to her in the purple dress. She's the chief constable of Thames Valley Police. When she first started as a, as a policeman, um, women weren't issued with truncheons. For those of you outside the UK, this is the kind of the big stick that, uh, that policemen carry. Anyway, the women weren't issued with, with truncheons. Um, so in riot situations, for instance, they would have to tag themselves along and run behind the men because the men would be <laughs> like this. But then they were issued with truncheons and they were handbag sized. <laughs> Lucy Winkett on the end, and the reason I'm doing this is because there are three bastions of masculinity that these women work in. Lucy Winkett is widely tipped to be the first bishop, woman bishop, if the Church of England ever agreed to have women bishops in, in the United Kingdom. And she was telling a story about how they refused, absolutely refused to adapt the robes for her when she was Dean of St. Paul's. Those robes have looked like that for the last, you know, thousand years and therefore we're not going to adapt them and she said she looked like dopey from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs with this robe pooling around her as she walked down um, through the church um, simple adaptations uh, which they eventually made okay what's next and the question was asked very provocatively by um, Louise yesterday Something about a new model of leadership. There's an article by Joanna Barsh published in, the, in a recent McKinsey um, uh, online journal. And she talks about the four qualities that are most often spoken about by staff about women leaders. And they talk about the fact that they bring four things that, that, that male leaders they have experienced don't bring. Intellectual stimulation, inspiration, participatory decision-making, setting expectations and rewards. And again, I urge you to read this, this article. Now, it seemed to me, looking at this, that this was not a bad model for the promise that we make to our students. The least we can give them is intellectual stimulation and actually maybe a bit of inspiration. We need to include them more and more, particularly in the UK in our new funding regime, in decision making. We need to make sure they're in the key committees, not just sitting there, but joining in. 
that they are contributing to all the important decisions and of course setting expectations and rewards. High quality feedback for the, the, the graph that they do in terms of assessment and also clarity around that, 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 um, that assessment and feedback. Um, I just think that it is, we need to marshal our arguments in, ter in, in the face of the instrumentalism that would treat our young people as consumers. We have to work towards a different kind of proposition with them, a different kind of compact. Okay, and my last slide you'll all be pleased to hear is um, another take on the um, participation rates. In England, you'll see um, that imbalance that we've been talking about all week. Is it an imbalance? Nobody complained when it was the other way around. Um, but 40% of young women enter higher education compared to 32% of young men. And the, um, uh, the imbalance in terms of discipline on the right-hand side there, the one that surprised me when I looked at it was maths, actually, um, that we've got majority of women in maths in, in my university. But I have to put a caveat on that. It's a very tiny department, so the numbers look um, probably better than they do. But look at mechanical engineering down the bottom there. No wonder they're um, grumpy about Margaret Harris getting the, uh, the research funding. Um, so anyway, I'm going to, uh, to leave it there and uh, hand over to my colleague. Thank you so much, Vice Chancellor Beer. Um, and next we have Vice Chancellor Sharifa Hapsa. Thank you, Lolin. And dear colleagues, happy Women's Day. So I hope I just tweeted uh, to say that we should not just break the grass, uh, the glass, <laughs> grass is also correct. We should not just break the glass ceiling, but actually pledge to be on the high bridge. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to share UKM's initiatives in uh, engaging with communities and with gender issues. Uh, and I will limit it to gender issues in Malaysia. Uh, in the time given to me, I will focus on the big picture, uh, which is how UKM engages uh, itself with the national transformation agenda. As you know, Malaysia has embarked on a national transformation program, uh, and gender is embedded in the concept of, of inclusivity in that plan. Then I'll explain some strategies we have adopted to support community engagement and gender issues and end with an initiative to illustrate UKM's engagement with gender issues in the community. If I have time, I would like to share with you some outcomes of gender equality efforts at UKM itself. Um, as you know, first the big picture, UKM is a national university, Kebangsaan means national, as well as a research university. And as a national university, we feel we should engage with national issues and not just local issues. And as a research university, we have a big role to play in the national transformation agenda where Malaysia aims to become a high-income nation, uh, which, which is about 16,000 US, uh, with an inclusive and sustainable economy that will result in a better quality of life for all people. So inclusivity here means, to be inclusive means no one is left behind. And that includes being gender inclusive. And that means addressing communities. And being a research university, technological innovation is an important aspect for us in how we can contribute to um, economic transformation through inventions and business growth. Inventing new products and services and creating high paying jobs. So we think we are part of the innovation system, that's how we see UKM, with the challenge to achieve excellence in six pillars. And these are to provide quality education to produce innovative and entrepreneurial human resources, creating successful pathways from R&D to innovation and commercialization, Engage with communities to transfer knowledge for a better quality of life, to practice good governance, to support the first three, we have to practice good governance, 
nurture strong leadership and manage our talents for effective succession. So how do we engage ourselves with communities? At the international level, UKM leverages on the strength of networks such as the Talwa Network. We were accepted as a member in 2009. I was elected a member of the steering committee, as Lolin said, last year. And as a member of the network, we are committed to the strengthening of the civic roles and social responsibilities of higher education. Currently, UKM is spearheading the Asia Talwa Network of Engaged Universities. And we have already engaged the ASEAN University Network, um, spearheading that network for social responsibility. And we put this together to call it Asia Engage. And I believe some of you may be coming to the meeting we're going to have later in the year to launch Asia Engage. And at the local level, at the national level, we collaborate closely through an MOU with the National Council of Women's Organizations of Malaysia. Of course, you know I'm the president, and that makes it easier. This is an, an umbrella body with 120 affiliate organizations representing a wide range of interests, uh, from women at the grassroots, in rural development, to entrepreneurial women, corporate women, professional women, welfare and religious organizations. Also, you, NCWO is a member of the ASEAN Confederation of Women's Organizations, or ACO, so we spread our wings to the regional level, as well as the International Council of Women. NCWO is recognized as the dialogue partner for issues pertaining to women, and we are always a member of the Malaysian delegation to the CSW in New York. And UKM has many areas, uh, in, uh, uh, common areas of interest with NCWO. So it's very easy to sit with this organization uh, in partnership because we believe in the same things, that women are equipped with the relevant knowledge, values, and skills to compete in a highly challenging socioeconomic environment. In particular, women, both in the formal and informal sectors, should be able to create and apply knowledge of science and technology to contribute to a high-income economy through innovations in medium, small, and micro enterprises. Another thrust is to ensure women are empowered with a supportive environment such as flexi hours and childcare facilities. And we are very involved in the early childhood education program in the country. A fourth thrust is to enable Malaysian women to take on greater role as promoters and nurturers of intercultural understanding towards realizing a truly integrated and harmonious One Malaysia. And UKM has a program with NCWO for our students. We are also a staunch advocate for equal rights in the eyes of society, policies, and law. And of course, in promoting resilience to environmental and climate change. So these are the same issues that UKM is interested in. So to support our community engagement and gender initiatives, we have evolved some structural and governance arrangements. Community engagement is given high priority. I have a deputy vice chancellor in charge of industry and community relations. She promotes and facilitates student, faculty, and also administrative staff activities in societal development, the, according to their interests, inclination, and expertise. And students obtain credits through learning contracts on community engagement activities. And at the same time, they develop leadership skills, teamwork, and social responsibility. Our annual appraisal. Uh, community engagement is part of the annual staff appraisal and promotion. Criteria include involving students and faculty in knowledge transfer that result in innovations which have an impact on the quality of life of communities. Also in research, an example uh, in, such as uh, installing solar panels in remote vill villages for energy generation. This is just an example, there are many more. Points are also given for involvement as office bearers in community organizations. Another initiative is 
the establishment of the Center for Women Leadership. This is to address issues of leadership and lack of women in decision making. A launching grant of four million has been given by the Ministry of Women, Family and Community to establish a chair in women leadership. And through the activities of the chair, this center will conduct research to develop a database of knowledge and resources in leadership grounded in the cultures of Malaysia and Southeast Asia and Asia in general. We want to be the leading reference center on Asian women's leadership and empowerment. And through its education and training, the center will enhance the leadership capabilities of women and build that critical mass of women leaders, specifically at the higher levels of management and decision making, both in the public and private sector. And through effective networking, we hope to transform leadership both at the individual and organizational level. And it aims to provide entrepreneurship capacity building program for 70 women from low income families. We broke them into two groups. It, this program is not just about the training, but it's the coaching and mentoring from academic faculty and students over a period of one year. And students learn from this project. They gain credits and experience from project work, assignments, and hands-on experience in coaching the participants. It is also a satisfying experience for them as they see real change unfolding right in front of their eyes as these business women gain value in the work that they are doing in their businesses. The activities, it's very, it's, well, the basic entrepreneurship, you know, is about finance for tiny businesses, accounts keeping, law, marketing, motivation, and presentation skills. A lot of them don't know this. Uh, be, uh, the first group were of food, uh, came from the food industry, so they were also given a food handling course, and then they were certified as food handlers. This is very important to be certified as a food handler, and it's organized by one of UKM subsidiary companies, Unipac. We do this for other organizations as well. And the students help them or introduce these women to the use of social media to promote their business. And it's, this, is, this is the important thing. A lot of women don't make use of social media, and this is a very important aspect for uh, entrepreneurship. And of course, presentation, yes, it's quite frightening for them to get up to present what they want to do. But presentation is very important in business. And of course, they have all these extraordinary opportunities to meet very important people. Here's Professor Muhammad Yunus, he's Nobel Laureate in residence in UKM. He's our guru in social business. We also have a center for social business. And a lot of the participants who met him reported this as a life-changing event for them. Um, I just want to show you some of the outcomes of this community engagement. These are the products of the participants before the program. Look at how shabby it is. Um, <laughs> you really don't want to buy this. Uh, but when, after students have worked with them, after they've gone through the courses, Ah, look at now, there's some packaging and branding uh, being injected, so there's value in there. And not only that, I think the participants learn when they apply new knowledge and skills, they add value. There's a kind of innovation here. It might be small, but it's still an innovation. And innovation leads to new value in costs. See the change from, it's about threefold. And it can sell at a higher price. It's still the same products, mind you. But now, they're selling it at a higher price. And people are buying. It looks nicer, and people are buying. I just want to end. I do have some time, Loli. Okay. Um, this is kind of report card from me. You can grade me if you like. Um, I've put there on August 27, 2006. Uh, because that's when I became vice chancellor. <clears throat> then... March 2006, the situation, and what happened in between. I will give you the figures where I had direct, I was directly involved in the decision making. But it's not 
because they are women, but it is based on merit. I feel it is, you have to really go out, look for them, and bring them on board. If not, these women are not going to come forward. For example, <coughs> professorial level, it has increased. Um, but of course, in the pipeline, we have to get more into the associate professor so that they can go up. But it is also through efforts of giving research grants, of having uh, flexi hours, of giving childcare facilities, and giving other opportunities for them. Um, Deputy Vice Chancellor, zero, and then I brought in two, so it's 50%. And one, one, of course, was the one in charge of communi community and industry partnership. The other one is in charge of a very important portfolio, which is research, innovation, and commercialization. And she's doing a wonderful job. Deans and directors, 15.34%. Uh, 25%, but what I want to show is the, this, the, the ones in the pipeline. We brought them in, groomed them. They are now in the pipeline. At some point, they were deans and directors. So 4.75 increase. And the top one for the professor, 1.87. And at deputy dean and director's level, 3.42 uh, increase. There, I think there's equal chance for both men and women. We have trained them, and that shows there's no gender discrimination either way. Um, and even in the administration, there need to be senior officers, 42% now are female, at mid-level, 57, and below it is at the entry level, now more and more women are coming in, which is a good sign, and we hope they remain, and we'll go up the ladder to senior levels. But student admission has always been in favor of females, uh, and it has remained at about 68 to 69%. But postgraduate is the one we are watching because we started very, very small, very few postgraduate students, but now it's showing a steady increase, and we hope to keep up. Because we're being a research university, postgraduate education will be 50% of the um, postgraduate students will be 50% of the population. So we need to watch this carefully. If not, the, the proportion will turn again. I think that's all I have. I want to thank you very much. Thank you very much for your fine presentations. I'll now turn to the audience for questions. We have a good 15 minutes or so. Francis from Ghana, and my question goes to the Vice Chancellor from Malaysia. In 2009-2010, it looked like there was a dip in the figures. Uh, was there any special reason for that? The last slide that she showed. Actually, the dip was uh, overall, I think, also. It was also in uh, in uh, the. I think there was a change in the fees, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, after that, we we I think made some adjustments. The fees were brought up high, and uh, I think we brought it down again. I think there was a general drop in. Admissions for that particular year, and the women came down. If it's not, a, I think anything that's related to gender. Maybe women can afford it, but I don't think there's anything uh, in religion except that I think the thing dropped because of uh, fee, fee Hello, I'm Samra Khan from Pakistan, and I have a question for Dr. Samina. Uh, you're in an absolutely unique position as being a VC of All Women's University. Most of us. Um, how do you find in your experience when women are going up the leadership ladder in your university, do they face some of the similar issues as in a mixed university or are the issues unique and uh, how do they find it? Is it difficult or? Well, we are in a pretty nascent stage at the moment. We are just started growing. 
And uh, some issues are unique, and some are similar, because human beings are the same all over. But there are certain issues which are unique to women who are in a women's university and uh, in, in promotions and things like that. Because uh, most of the women, they, at the entry level, they, there are lots of women who can come in. But because they also have to do childbearing, child rearing activity uh, as part of their lifespan, so they do not publish. So sometimes there is this feeling inside them that they are being left behind because they can't give that kind of a time. Which is also in co-ed universities where men do the publishing and women do the housekeeping and housework in the department and at home. But I think it's slowly changing and evolving because it, this university was created as a university and not upgraded from a college into a university. So it does have a research and intensive culture and it research is en encouraged and women are getting more sort of into a position where they are publishing. We are bringing out two journals now and that kind of a thing which are HEC recognized. In fact, one has been funded by HEC. So that makes a difference, I think, which is also gives them a little bit of a privilege being in this university. So I don't know whether I've satisfied you or not, but this is what the situation is. Okay, there is some steady increase in students' population in the postgraduate studies, which in other places like my country, Kenya, is a bit of a challenge. To get a steady increase, especially among the females, is a bit of a challenge. What are some of the motivating factors? Is the, the postgraduate level free or what motivates you to have that steady increase? Because for us, it's a bit challenging. They have to pay undergraduate, masters, and the rest. So the student's population at the postgraduate level is declines on gender. You get now there are more men than women. So what is the secret why you have some good steady increase in the female population? Thank you. Uh, my feeling is uh, that as more and more women graduate from the universities, uh, more will go into postgraduate education. You know, already ours is like 68 to 69 percent women. And uh, if you are thinking of pursuing higher education, then chances are you're going to get women. That's number one. Number two is uh, sometimes because of downturn, the downturn in the economy, they will go into postgraduate education first, um, rather than go get a job. And so a lot of the women will also do that. Uh, so I think that's uh, some of the reasons. I, I like to think it's because there's a woman vice chancellor there. <laughs> but I don't think so. But we should do um, a more detailed analysis. Uh, actually, one third of our postgraduate students are women, and you also see a lot of women from the other countries coming to UK. Thank you very much. My name is Khomo uh, Zomahi from uh, Botswana, the University of Botswana. Um, my question, I guess, is directed to uh, a professor from uh, Fatima Jina, the Women's uh, University. I, I really like the idea of, of growing that uh, community spirit um, in our women as, as they go through higher education. And the picture that was uh, presented was very wonderful, rosy. Um, maybe you alluded to a few problems here and there, being uh, diligent to ensure that they don't end up in um, organizations and businesses that are owned by their relatives and so on. But I, I would have loved to hear a little bit about the, the problems, the attendant problems of managing a program like that. And I'm asking because um, at the University of Botswana, we are interested in, in uh, getting this whole notion of service uh, learning uh, uh, going. And so we would like to know really organizationally, what does it take to manage that? What are the issues? What are the problems uh, and the pitfalls to, to, to avoid? Thank you. What we have tried to do is that we have, we have a placement office at the university. But you, 
initially we made the placement office responsible for it. The students applied for working in different organizations and it went to the placement office, but now it goes to the department. The department, um, head of the department, the teachers, they sort out the applications and then they depart, they, there's a department coordinator who does a kind of a mini research to see where they are headed and whether these are genuine organizations where they are going because safety is also an issue with us. And uh, it's a lot of orientation exercise is um, carried out by the placement office before these girls go for voluntary work because we are still, it's a patriarchal society and we have to inform them that you're going to work with men and they may seem like your uncles, they are not avancular in their attitudes. So be on guard. So all this it goes on. But now logistically, it is, how it is managed is, it is through the department to the Women Research and Resource Center. So there is a conduit and the applications are weighted and they're put into sort of the four sections and other, another section which is miscellaneous. And that is how we have organized it. The Women Research and Resource Center has research officers who look at it and then they send it. And they, it is the, this center now which, which tries to sort of counsel the students before they go out about how they are expected to behave, the norms of behavior, because that is also a challenge, you know, because they think these, I mean, th there are exploit, they can get exploited and they can be sort of, initially some, somebody may say, let's go out for a cup of tea and you have to tell them, you know, that be on your guard, you know, what is behind that cup of tea. So that, that is, all these logistic things have to be put into, have been, uh, we're still trying to put them into place, you know, every time a new problem comes up. And then we try to sort of um, plug it there and then and warn the others. So it is, in, in a year, it is about a batch of 1,200 students which we send out to do this. And we try to sort of spread it over the year so there is uh, sustainability and a commitment which is going on. But it is a lot, lot of logistic arrangement, which we, we have to do. A question is directed to the Vice Chancellor of Malaysia. I think you mentioned something about early childhood care and development. I wanted to find out whether you were in, uh, your group was represented in Hawaii or Nuru last year, and whether this group uh, that is doing that work uh, is attached to the network because I want to link up with that network. I don't know about the, the network, but we were instrumental in developing the policy paper uh, and uh, getting it uh, implemented as a pilot project first and now it's rolled out nationally. The idea is to um, make sure children below the age of five years <coughs> because after that they go to preschool. Uh, so there's a continuity uh, from birth to preschool and then to school. Uh, and the project is to make sure children have quality education uh, and care, uh, including health and nutrition. Uh, and that is learning is fun, uh, that is exploratory and so on. So this is the project that started, it actually is under the Prime Minister's department. Funding comes from that department, and uh, we it, we at some points it's now five years I think four or five years. We thought we could hand over to one of the nine ministries, but they are not they are not ready for this kind of uh, education and care. Ministry of Women, for example, uh, look at welfare. Look at <laughs> early childhood as a welfare uh, activity. So it's just about setting up kindergartens and making sure it's safe. But we are looking at the education, the development of the child. So that's not suitable until they change. And the school, Ministry of Education is also not ready because they are trying to get all the preschool classes ready first. So I think it will remain where it, where it is. Um, there's a minister, there's a, uh, the University of um, Teacher Training, I think it's education. We've given the job to them to do the research in early childhood education. And perhaps they are linked to your network. Uh, two other universities help in training the teachers for early childhood education. One of them is my university. The other one that we, uh, we have helped to develop is gifted and talented. The 
the, the school for gifted and talented children is in UKM. So we believe that in the pipeline, the education pipeline, you must not let uh, any child be missed. So every child is precious right from the beginning, early childhood education and care. Then about 5% are the gifted children. If they go to the normal school and they are missed, then these children become so-called troublesome in school and some drop out. And so we started the school for the gifted and there's a, a very extensive way of identifying them so that they come to, the younger ones come to our annual camps, which we do with Johns Hopkins. And the, at the age of 15 and 16, they are admitted into our school for the gifted. Now this is very important because they have different learning needs and uh, they, are, they are so advanced that at the age of 15, these kids have set for the American SAT. 15 of them have qualified. And actually, they have, we have encouraged them to apply. And all 15 have been accepted into the Ivy Leagues because they qualified their scores are Ivy League scores. But we are getting Johns Hopkins to help us make sure they select the universities that can cater to them look after these younger children. So you know, you have to be careful. In your population, there will be kids like this. Uh, gifted kids who this not, they're not taken care and the school do not know and the school label them as problematic children. And uh, But actually, they are very advanced and they have special needs. So these are some of the, the things that at the national level, we try to address some of the issues uh, for uh, related to e uh, the ECDC or early childhood development in the mountain university, this is a self-sustaining program. We are not funded by any, but the parents who bring their children to the school, we provide them facilities, but they have to pay. So it is self-sustaining and self-developing as we go along, and I think that is uh, the root of it, because if we look at the Ministry of Women Development, they have their own agenda. Uh, the education department has its own agenda, but what the university can provide is what the parents are looking for. So we specifically tailor their car programs, or there are specialized people working with the ECDC. So this is one model. Uh, related to the problems uh, that were uh, of uh, the community work, when I started it, this was 1998-99. 350 students and I said there has to be community work. Now the university that was given to us was a huge place with no gardeners, no painters. So I said, well, charity begins at home. So start cleaning up the university. And I get phone calls from parents. I sent my daughter for higher education. And you've given her a shovel, you've given her a paintbrush. I said, well, this is part of learning. She has to use her hands to do the work, and once she does that, now that was the beginning, but then we started sending them out, and as I can see, it is doing very well. So there always are problems, but if you know where you're going, and if you know what the vision is, it will become a success. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you for that comment. Sounds like it's uh, working with your hands and being engaged is in the DNA of the university, so to speak. Um, we've got quite a lively discussion going now. I'm, I'm reluctant to um, cut it short. So I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, in the front row here. I'm Maria Mra, and I have a question from both the vice chancellors from the mixed universities. Um, in terms of the framework of quality and excellence, um, what space as vice chancellors do you have to encourage women uh, in terms of recruitment, because for UN bodies, we see a lot of advertisements coming out where they say women are encouraged to apply. Being a women's university, coming from a women's university, we say preference will be given to the women candidates. But is there any overt policy which you can use to, to the optimum for having more women in mixed universities? Do you mean, do you mean as students or staff or both staff? Um, well, one of the reasons why I didn't put figures up like my colleagues is because I've presided over a decline in the number of senior managers uh, who are women in the university, um, mainly partly because I've expanded the senior team, but partly because 
the employment situation in the UK at the moment is making people very conservative in terms of moving around. And so, you know, you start off with a short list of six for a senior post and then it gets, then they, they go back to their institutions and say, well, actually, I'd rather stay. What will you give me to stay? And um, so then you get down to kind of three. And then by the time you get to the end, it's all men. Um, and um, so it is actually quite difficult. Uh, our laws do not allow for positive discrimination in, in any way. Um, we have a very good record in the university in terms of senior research appointments. So we have a higher proportion of professors than, than most universities. It's getting up towards 30%. Um, and the, there are more senior lecturers um, that are women, and there are more, um, it's getting up to equal on, on um, principal lecturers. And one of the reasons is because we encourage people on fractional appointments to apply for promotion. So that's in there. There are also all kinds of routes through to promotion. So there's, there is, a, in fact, a, a, a civic engagement route. There's a, um, there's a knowledge transfer route as well as a research route. And there is a teaching excellence route, although it has to be said that not many women opt for that one. We have the same problem as in other institutions where the women um, make sure that they've covered every base before they put themselves in for promotion, whereas, you know, the men do tend to kind of, they don't mind rejection, whereas a woman will, you know, take it to heart and you won't see an application again. Even if there's, even if you say, once this is in the public domain, you will definitely get this. They're still kind of, well, I've done it once and you didn't give it to me kind of thing. But we, we work hard in our, in our professional development and review to kind of counter those, those narratives. We have, uh, you see, leadership is not about administration or management. So we impress right in our uh, appraisal system and in the promotion system that if you are an academic staff, uh, there, are, there are three things that you have to do. Uh, and you can have a combination of this. And you can excel in all three. Uh, you can excel in two or you can excel in one. But you must, you must determine for yourself what is your interest. And this will be in the teaching track. We don't call it track. It's very sensitive because um, academics don't like to be shoved into a track. You see, there's a punishment. Uh, there's a research intensive. Those who, who say, I, I'm going to devote more time to research. Some will say more to teaching. And there's also, there are also some who are very good at consultancy and service, and particularly in the medical area is the clinical service. So we do have excellence and quality in all these three things. Some will excel in all three. These are really the true, the real track, <laughs> the real track where they excel in three. But of course, there are people who give put more time uh, on the other, in, in the other two tracks as well. So as long as they show excellence and we have criteria for excellence, in education, it's not enough to say, I'm teaching so many hours. They really have to show the innovations and what do they do, and the student report on the, the feedback survey that we have. I mean, they really have to be excellent to say, I am the excellent teacher, or I am the excellent researcher. There are also criteria of publications and research grants and so on. So I think if, if you're very clear and tell them what the expectations are, I think they will work. Otherwise, we tell them maybe the university is not a place for you. Uh, but I find the women take up the challenge. Uh, they're very serious in their work. Uh, I, I think women don't politic, don't do that much politicking as much as the, the I'm sorry, I, I may be gender biased here. But I think, I think women, by my experience in my university, set the targets and get them to work. The women get down to work very quickly. Mm. They accept it and they will do it. I'm a research university now. I am in a research university. This is what the university wants. We'll get them. A lot of the resistance mm. actually come from the older male academics. Mm. Uh, and uh, so we hope to just face them out. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, uh, we've gone, I'm mindful that we've gone over by just a minute or so. Uh, I've, got at least two hands in the audience. Thank you very much. And uh, the three presentations were very enlightening about uh, community service. 
But I have one concern, and, and it's interesting that you're all three women vice chancellors, which is just amazing. Because we have got very few women vice chancellors, at least in Kenya, where I come from. My concern is that uh, the, the picture you have all presented is, is, is very rosy and very good on what the universities are doing out there. And my concern is what the universities are doing in what? Because I'll give you an example of um, an university in Kenya that is headed, one of the oldest Kenyan universities that is headed by a woman vice chancellor that has done a lot of work. If she was to present in a conference like this, everybody would be wow because of the growth that she has overseen in the university, infrastructure growth, a lot of community service, a lot of money has come into that university. They have actually even set up a medical school and a mortuary and the people who work in that university say that that mortuary was set up there because the number of deaths of staff has actually gone up because of stress <laughs> and frustration and lack of, total lack of support of members of staff. So I just wanted to know, that's a very sort of negative picture of the university, but it's indeed a very true one. And there's a big uh, ex exodus of, of, of women, especially from that university, because they feel very unsupported. So when we talk about service to the community, to the society, are we thinking about the university as a society too that requires um, service? Because it's, it's, I think lecturers do get very frustrated because it's more and more work on them and it's really selling, it's marketing and how then do we look after ourselves? Thank you. Thank you for an excellent closing question. I'd like to ask each of the panelists to say a few words on that. As facilitating as possible, you know, you are absolutely right because what is presented is a rosy p picture. The nitty gritty and the logistics and the mechanics are not pleasant of putting th through these programs and these innovations. But when we are looking inwards, there are certain, I mean, Dr. Najma is here and there, there are certain things which we can manage to do and there are certain things over which the law of the land prevails. I'll just give you one example. when. Young women join the university, and when they are asked for when they ask for maternity leave, the government says it's 12 weeks, and the doctor gives an EDD expected date of delivery, and it has to be six weeks before that and six weeks after that. If you have a premature baby, your leave before the birth is cancelled, and you have to come back after the six weeks. If you deliver a baby two weeks late, it means you are with your child for only four weeks. We have campaigned, we have talked to people, we have tried to, and the answer is no, this is what the law of the land says, you can't go beyond that. So sometimes our hands are tight like that, you know, but sometimes we can manage to facilitate and we can, being women, I'm in a unique position because we are in a women's university. So it is liberating in a way that you can understand each other's problem and you try to facilitate women in their, in their, um, in their jobs, in their trainings, and we try to look for what is happening and what, what, and they have unique problems. So we try to facilitate that, but sometimes our hands are tight and we can't go beyond that. Number one, I think, is to set your expectations so that people know well, what to expect. And then you help them to achieve their expectations. And I, I do believe uh, women do have some special needs. Uh, I know mentoring and coaching um, have been proposed as methods of helping uh, women. But you know, research has shown that actually what women need and will help them most in their career advancement is childcare facilities. So every university, and my university will make this, and that's why early childhood education and care is very important. The childcare, uh, facility in the university actually is part of this early childhood kind of care. And so I've just built a new facility for the staff. I mean, when I came, it was very old and doesn't look very nice. And now it's attached to the faculty of education so that they know that, you know, it's, it's a sensible place to send, a safe, uh, quality place to send the children. I think that's one of the important that you need. Other, other than that, you know, the, the academies go on very flexi hours. I mean, nobody's going to do at what time you come as long as you do your work. But they want to know that their children are safe, especially the young ones. And I think uh, child care facilities is very good. 
apart from mentoring and coaching, of course, which we try to do get the older ones to mentor and coach the young ones. Nursery at Brooks is one of my favourite places to visit, by the way. I don't get asked <laughs> any awkward questions when I go there. And I, and I get quite a few cuddles as well, so that's always good. Um, the, um, and the majority of staff who use it are the men. Um, I think you have to work with your institutional DNA. When I see unhappy institutions, I see a leader who's gone in with a preconception of what they want a university to look like, and they want to mold it to their own image. I spent quite a lot of time at Brooks learning the institution before I did anything. Okay, so learning what it was good at, learning what the dominant cultures were, and how you might develop those and support people positively and also make sure that the people who work hard aren't in a sense being abused by those who don't work hard so it's not mm. that you're you're wanting to feather bed life and, and and not to challenge people's assumptions you want to challenge them but in a very positive way and one of the things that i have been doing a lot because there has been huge uncertainty in the united kingdom because of the change in funding arrangements and will the students still come and will they be demanding things because they will you know I'm paying for this in a different way etc and um, that you have to make sure that colleagues have your support to do what they are good at to you know to to provide outstanding learning and teaching to to work on their research to to inject their research into the curriculum to make sure that you know that that there is again another virtuous circle there that people are given the chance to flourish and that you put the right support mechanisms in place and sometimes you have to you, you, you have to do tough stuff because the financial climate is is such but one of the things that I've really worked hard at achieving is a structure that allows for innovation to come up because nothing will work in an academic environment if it's my idea imposed it has to come up and you have to go with the grain of the strengths of your wonderful, innovative, inventive colleagues. And so, you know, the, the added value we were able to give students who volunteer in the community is the Brooks Future Leaders Award, which the Institute of Leadership and Management come in, give them a, an intensive program, they write an assignment, it gives them an additional qualification to their degree, devised by my absolutely fantastic head of careers. So, you know, you support people to do the things that achieve what you generally want to do. But it, it, you know, there is that delicate balance between you know, needing to do particular mm -hmm. things that are actually enforced upon you by, by government or you know, changes in policy or whatever, and actually you know, allowing people the space to flourish and develop and, you know, and provide innovation into the institution. But as I said, it's, it's very important to understand what your colleagues are good at and to give them the, the opportunity to develop. Thank you so much for raising and closing on the notion of leadership at all levels. I would just wrap up by saying thank you so much to the volunteers and the organizers and Dorothy Garland in particular for all your, of your generous help with organizing this panel. And many thanks um, personally to all of the panelists for being leaders in higher education. And I'd like to just end with a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.